welcome you to this uh, CMR highlights of the American Society of Hematology meeting 2023. This is our first ICLF conversation of 2024, the first of many, and look forward to continuing these conversations with you over the year. So for this CMR highlights of, the, of ASH, we are very privileged to have two experts in the field. So, so Dr. Narody Shanmugnathan from Adelaide in Australia and Professor Mike Dunninger from Milwaukee in the, in the US. So both will be doing their clinical and biological highlights. Narody will present the clinical highlights and Mike the biological highlights. So, Without further ado, we will get started with these uh, highlights of ASH 2023. So the clinical overview will be presented by uh, Dr. Narali Shagamathan. Narali works as a consultant hematologist at the Royal Adelaide Hospital and SA Pathology. And she's a clinical research fellow at the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute in Adelaide, Australia. She completed her CML fellowship with Professor Timothy Hughes and Professor Susan Branford at SAMRI. And following this, she completed her PhD investigating the genomic pathways of resistance and response in CML. So Narani chaired the education session at ASH on how to tackle the remaining challenges in CML in December. And so she'll be presenting the key highlights of the meeting with us today. So Narani, I'll hand over to you now, and we look forward to hearing from you. Um, so Nicola and Nicola and Stephanie, thank you for inviting me to present on the exciting clinical updates in CML that were recently presented at ASH. And as per Nicola's introduction, my name is Narani Shanmuganathan, and I'm one of the hematologists working in Adelaide in South Australia, um, uh, focusing on CML. So um, these are my disclosures. Um, and the, I decided to pick a few abstracts that I thought were key um, messages from the 2023 ASH uh, meeting. The first abstract that I'll cover is the Australian Ascend study, which was presented by Associate Professor David Jung. Um, and the um, abstract from the update from the German Tiger study, which is presented by Andreas Hockhaus from Germany. So as mentioned earlier, the first presentation um, is on the Ascend data, which is presented by my colleague, David Jung. Um, and the Ascend study is an Australian study sponsored by the ALLG and one of the first studies investigating a simulib in frontline treatment of newly diagnosed chronic phase CML. And I have to thank David Jung for sharing his slides with me to facilitate this presentation. So as many of you will know, Asimunib is the first in class stamp inhibitor targeting the meristoil pocket and has been approved for use in resistant and intolerant CML following two or more TKIs. Um, and the approval was based on the phase one data as well as the phase three assemble study. And the early findings of ASCEND were presented at ASH 2022, but this update was on the analysis of the primary endpoint. So the ASCEND study is a phase two study, which enrolled about a hundred, over hundred patients, just over hundred patients across 14 sites across Australasia with two key co-primary endpoints, early molecular response achievement at three months and major molecular response achievement by 12 months. And the enrolled patients were commenced on 40 milligrams twice daily of asimunib, and thereafter patients were monitored for achievement of time-dependent ELN milestones, with the potential to either add in a second TKI in the event of milestone failure, or dose escalation to 80 milligrams twice daily in the event of warning signals. Once patients had achieved MMR at by, by the 12 month mark point though, they were able to um, change, alter the dose to 80 milligrams daily for convenience sake. So the demographic breakdown is shown in this table with the median age of enrolled patients being approximately 57 years of age um, with, as, uh, with as commonly seen in CML, a male preponderance. The ELTS distribution is also demonstrated 
with um, a skew towards low risk patients, which is what's often observed in um, our CML studies these days. So moving on to the adverse events with hematological toxicities shown with grade three to four events being relatively infrequent. But as, um, as was reported in the previous studies, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia and anemia have been reported with in association with the simonib. But the frequency of grade three to four um, hematological toxicities was less uh, approximately 5% or less. From a biochemical perspective, however, lipase elevations were observed and at 16%, um, which is um, not unexpected, um, although grade three to four events were only 6%. Liver function, um, liver function derangements were also observed as well, but relatively infrequently. Other toxicities observed are also listed in this table here, which includes fatigue and gastrointestinal symptoms, such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea being the most frequently reported events. Most of these events were minor and relatively self-resolving. There was a single case of pulmonary embolism um, in a patient that had developed uh, severe pneumonia and sepsis, um, and, this, uh, and there were also reports of um, pain episodes um, non-specific pain episodes in the abdomen, back or chest. With regards to toxicities of special interest, specifically arterio occlusive events, which obviously in the context of TKI therapy and the history of nilotinib and phenapnib um, was a toxicity of specific interest. There was a single report of an arterio occlusive event in an elderly lady with pre-existing vascular risk factors who um, had um, pre-existing diabetes and hypertension and obesity. She was, main, she was able to be maintained on 80 milligrams daily and had actually achieved a very good response with MR4 by six months. Um, but by the six month time point, but unfortunately had developed a lacuna infarct at 20 months, but had excellent neurological recovery, but unfortunately had a second event in the same territory uh, approximately eight months later. Um, this was the only uh, reported arterial occlusive events um, by the um, time the study was analyzed in anticipation of ASH. At the time of um, the study analysis, 16 patients had discontinued Asimunib, nine for perceived intolerances, which included lipase elevation, and two cases of marked cytopenia and aplasia. And these patients required withdrawal from the study and required eventual allogeneic stem cell transplantation. From the resistance side of things, seven patients withdrew, including two patients with EMR failure, and five with secondary resistance. A single patient progressed a lymphoid blast crisis with evidence of a simonib specific kinase domain mutations at progression um, six months after study enrollment. Of the patients with resistance, four patients had reported kinase domain mutations, including the patient who progressed a lymphoid blast crisis. Three of these four patients with reported mutation events um, had a simonib specific kinase domain mutations, and the other patient had developed a T315i. So on to the first co-primary endpoint, 93% of patients had achieved an EMR, but of the seven patients that had not achieved an EMR, only two were frank EMR failures, with their BCR ABLE values shown here, um, with the, uh, one at 24% and the second value at 210%. The two patients with florid EMR failure ended up with con combination therapy. The first patient um, had disatinib added to um, asimonib, but then required switching to disatinib monotherapy after development of cytopenia, and the BCR able managed to fall to 1.5% at nine months. Um, follow up is still the ongoing follow up is still continuing. The second patient did not tolerate combination therapy with dysatinib with development of severe headache and was required to be withdrawn off study, but then developed primary resistance to all other TKIs before proceeding to an allogeneic stem cell transplant for rescue. There was a third patient who commenced combination therapy due to failure of achieving milestones by the 12-month time point, the outcome of which is still pending. 
So when evaluating the second of the co-primary endpoints, 78% of patients achieved major molecular response by 12 months. Four patients were yet to reach, uh, reach the 12 months of follow-up, and the 12 patients shown in red discontinued before the 12-month follow-up period without MMR achievement being um, uh, without MMR achievement. Nine patients had not achieved MMR by 12 months, although the vast majority had at least achieved a BCR able of less than 1%, and eight out of nine patients were relatively close to reaching MMR. The cumulative incidence of MMR is shown here with the 12 month rate of achievement being 78% as indicated previously, increasing to 87% at 24 months. Importantly, the rate of DMR with MR 4.5 achievement at 12 months was 32%, which then rose to 56% at the 24 month time point. Importantly, when evaluating the molecular responses at three months, we can see that 94% of patients achieved EMR by three months, um, with almost 50% of patients achieving MMR by this time point, with 14% of patients also achieving MR 4.5 by three months. And when we compare the outcome with the other ALLG CML studies, uh, with the frontline nilotinib pegylated interferon combination in blue, um, which is the pinnacle study, dose adjusted disatinib in green, um, which is the direct study in or CML12, or high dose imatinib title II study in yellow, we can see that how asiminib compares and at least achieves uh, appears to achieve deeper responses compared to the other frontline studies so far. So in conclusion about the ASCEND study, the, this has shown that assimilative in the frontline setting is relatively well tolerated with only one instance so far of arteriocclusive events. Patients have excellent and early achievement of molecular response with low resistance and transformation rate. And so far, this study appears to demonstrate that assimilative monotherapy could be a promising approach in frontline therapy. So moving on to the next presentation that I wanted to focus on, which is the update from the TIGER study presented by Andreas Hockhaus from Germany, which is titled Treatment-Free Remission After Nilotinib Plus Pegylated Interferon Alpha Induction and Pegylated Interferon um, Alpha Maintenance Therapy for Newly Diagnosed CML Patients. The background of the study is that while second generation drugs enable a higher proportion of patients to achieve a deep molecular remission compared with imatinib, um, but require longer duration of TK, but, but with longer duration of TKI exposure, this cumulative accumula um, of accumulation of toxicity. So methods to shorten TKI exposure while enabling an achievement of DMR was crucial to achieve TFR eligibility and achievement. And this was the study schema, which was originally a small pilot study investigating the feasibility and safety of nilotinib with combination with pegylated interferon, before moving to the larger randomized study, which involved 692 patients. Once MMR was confirmed at 18 and 24 months, the maintenance phase could begin. And if patients were then able to maintain MR4 for more than 12 months after a minimum of 30 mu 36 months of therapy, they were eligible to stop therapy. The primary endpoints are shown here with the rates of MMR at 18 months with um, uh, being one of the endpoints with the rate of continuous MMR following TFR attempt at 12 and 24 months following discontinuation being the second uh, primary endpoint. And there are a range of secondary endpoints which are shown here as well. Patient demographics are shown here once more, demonstrating a male preponderance with a median age of patients enrolled of 51 years of age. The risk profiles are spread evenly as expected across the two treatment arms with a similar rate of low risk ELTS risk patients as the ASCEND work. The consort diagram is shown here with patient disposition breakdown with a similar proportion of patients in both treatment arms achieving the end of induction, which was confirmed MMR after two years of TKI. Similar rates of maintenance completion was also noted across the two arms. So evaluation of the first primary endpoint showed that nilotinib and interferon combination had an 88% um, rate of MMR by 18 months, compared with 81% of patients um, with nilotinib monotherapy. The p-value was uh, significant at 0 0.02. But the cumulative incidences of DMR is shown to be improved with the addition of pegylated interferon to nilotinib with both MR4 
and MR 4.5 achievement um, being demonstrated earlier with combination therapy, although the curves eventually meet up later. But it does demonstrate that the addition of pegylated interferon does enable DMR to be reached sooner. So this graph demonstrates the number of patients that were able to achieve a TFR with TKI discontinuation with interferon monotherapy. Essentially, 129 out of 279 patients were able to discontinue TKI and continue monotherapy with interferon, and 79 patients were able to enter a treatment-free remission. And of the 79 patients, 86% were able to remain in a treatment-free remission 24 months after interferon discontinuation. Of the 11 patients that lost MMR, however, one patient relapsed in blast sprays, which, is quite, which was quite concerning. But when looking at the intention to treat analysis of the two arms with regards to molecular relapse-free survival after treatment discontinuation, there is a minor improvement in nilotinib pegylated interferon combination arm compared with the nilotinib monotherapy arm, although the p-value was not shown to be significant at 0.12. Worryingly, though, there were 20 cases of progression, accounting for about 3% of the enrolled population, including 17 patients with blast phase, although most of these occurred during induction. And when evaluating deaths, there were nine CML-related deaths, including eight that died in blast phase. When comparing the two arms, there was no difference in overall or progression-free survival between the two arms, with the eight-year overall survival being 95% and the eight-year progression-free survival being 93%. And when evaluating the toxicities of interest, the rates of arterial um, hypertension, vascular disorders, and peripheral vascular disease, this was higher in the nilotinib monotherapy arm compared with the combination therapy arm. But in the combination therapy arm, as expected, fatigue, flu-like symptoms, and cytopenias were much more common. So this trial concluded that the combination of nilotinib and pegylated interferon is associated with higher rates of deep molecular response, but did also impact tolerability. Pegylated interferon maintenance therapy is a feasible option and reduces the duration of TKI treatment and therefore the cumulative um, rates of toxicity associated with TKI, and therefore specifically can reduce the cumulative risk of vascular events on agents such as nilotinib. There was a trend towards improvement of long-term TFR in patients treated with combination therapy. And with that, I will um, conclude and hand over to my co-speaker. Thank you, Narani. Thank you. It's a really, obviously, good overview and in-depth um, presentations of these two abstracts.